How have Muslims expressed beauty? It's an important question to ask at a time when there's so much ugliness in the world. When we were making our Islamic art film and showed some of the world's most beautiful works of art and architecture, that's the question we asked ourselves. The Quran speaks about beauty and uses different words. Each one has a slightly different meaning. One word the Quran uses is zina, implying handsomeness. As in the Quranic verse, wear your most handsome clothes at every time and place of prayer, but don't be extravagant. A second Quranic term is ihsan, referring to a beautiful spiritual state. In describing Blessed Mary, Mother of Jesus, the Quran says that she was someone who grew in ihsan, in purity and in beauty. A third term is jamil, which implies majesty, as in Allahu jamilun yuhibbul jamal. God is beautiful and loves beauty. So beauty in Islam and in Islamic art are both visible and invisible. It's interesting, some of the art historians we consulted when making the film said the term Islamic art is too broad. They would say there are no connections between Syrian metalwork and a Persian rug. There's nothing in common between an adobe mosque in Central Africa and a towering minaret in Turkey. But perhaps what is common is that these Muslim artists had deep in their psyche an understanding of Zina and Hassan and Jamil, of outward beauty, inward beauty, and reverence to majesty. With these concepts in mind, let's work to bring more beauty into the world. Allahu Jamilun Yuhibbul Jamal. Thank you for being a part of the UPF family, and inshallah, we'll see you soon. The narrative of human history is punctuated by war and conquest, triumph and catastrophe. But in the end, what endures? It is not the struggle that is lasting in our consciousness and treasured in our museums. It is the outpouring of creativity and intelligence that is civilization's greatest gift. The true legacy of Islamic culture is revealed in the nuance and ingenuity of its art and architecture. That feeling of the encounter with majesty, the encounter with monumentality, it transcends culture, it transcends history, it is a kind of universal human experience of the arts. We use art, we use architecture to crystallize our deepest emotions and our deepest aspirations for an understanding of our place in the world. These monuments and artifacts continue to inspire us. They herald the finest qualities of Islamic culture and show us the best of individual achievements. Each contributes a crucial part in the ascent of world civilization. The seventh century was a turning point in history. In Europe, the Germanic tribes that had overrun the Roman Empire struggled for supremacy as they shaped their feudal kingdoms. To the east, the once great empires of Byzantium and Persia were weakened by centuries of mutually destructive wars. At that moment, the tribes of Arabia began one of history's greatest revolutions in power, religion, culture, and wealth, united under the new faith of Islam. From its birth in the Arabian Peninsula, Islam spread across the basin of the Mediterranean Sea, eventually reaching from Indonesia to Spain. 
and from this diverse civilization and the extraordinary wealth of its rulers came an outpouring of artistry. Objects and buildings, gardens and paintings reflect how this new culture grew in a varied and complex world. It's not only about beautiful things. It's not only about looking at specific techniques or how a beautiful object looks in a museum. It's more like a window on a culture. Islamic art is um, a reflection of the people and the context in which it was produced. And that, of course, makes art even that much more important because it is a reflection of who we are and what we are and will be memorialized in, in the years to come. The themes that emerged as Islamic art developed show us the similarities in our common cultures, how our techniques and styles are shared and transformed. Well, there are some aspects of art and architecture that are universal, that you don't need to learn to appreciate to get it. So I might have to learn Arabic to read the inscriptions, but I don't have to read Arabic to appreciate the purity of simple black script on a white background on a plate. It is elegance, and it's elegance that speaks through the centuries. In Muslim tradition, Islam began in 610 in a cave in Mecca, where an angel came upon the Prophet Muhammad and revealed to him the words of the Quran. In the first revelation, God proclaimed himself the Creator and said, Read, for your Lord is the most generous, the one who taught the use of the pen, taught man what he did not know. More than poetry, more than a holy book, it was the very word of God. For Christians, God's gift was his son. He sent down his son to save mankind. For Muslims, God sent down a revelation. So the parallel is between Christ and an oral revelation. Because God's gift to mankind in Islam is the Quran, writing becomes the central feature of Islamic culture. And the use of the word everywhere from day-to-day -day objects to Quran manuscripts is the one feature that separates Islamic culture from all others. The earliest dated words of the Quran are found in a stone building in Jerusalem, one of the most sacred and politically charged cities in the world. Built in 692, it is called the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock would have been a familiar building in terms of form, that is, the, the shape, the arches, the techniques of decoration would have all been within the local Christian vocabulary. It borrows the form from a Byzantine martyrium, and a martyrium is simply a building that marks the place of a martyrdom or perhaps the burial place of a saint. But instead of a burial site, the dome covers a massive rock believed by Muslims to be the sacred place from which Muhammad ascended to heaven on his mystical night journey to pray with Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. The thing that makes this a uniquely Islamic building is the Arabic inscription that runs around it. That is, in effect, the sign that says, this is from a new culture. This isn't just somebody putting up words. This is somebody who cares. This is carefully composed. This is beautiful writing, calligraphy. The interior inscription talks constantly about how God is one, not three. And this is clearly a rebuttal to Christianity, where the primary focus is that God sent down his son and God is tripartite. And for Muslims, this is anathema, God is one, not three. So clearly there is some kind of response to the Christian presence in the city. That inscription is made in gold cubes. They're small glass cubes with gold foil on them. They are by far the most expensive kind of cube. And in Christian buildings, often are used for halos or used behind the figure of Christ. In the Dome of the Rock, they're used for this inscription that runs around the building. The Quran became the focus of devotion, but it also became the focus of art. 
From the earliest times on, Muslims tried to make Quran manuscripts as beautiful as possible. Calligraphy, the art of beautiful writing, is considered more important than all the other arts. Today, one of the most well-respected Muslim calligraphers in the world is a convert from California. After teaching himself Arabic and working for over 20 years to perfect his art, Mohammed Zachariah finally traveled to Turkey to learn from the masters in 1983. Basically, they made a deal and they said, if you want to start all the way from the beginning, if you want to forget everything you learned about calligraphy for a while and, and, and sort of go from blank from start, just like you'd never picked up a pen before, and go through the lessons, he says, we'll be behind you all the way with this thing and help you out. But if you can't do that, have a nice time in Istanbul. <laughs> Zachariah accepted the challenge and began to learn his craft again, just as the first masters had before him. Traditionally, Muslims always wrote with a reed pen. So you went out and you had reeds or you imported reeds. Trimming the pen is even more important. Cutting the nib is even more important than actually the reed itself. And you have a tool on which you lay the reed when you cut it and a special knife. And people collected these tools and gathered them in their little tool boxes. Decorated with geometric designs and calligraphy, these tool boxes alluded to the practical use of the box as well as the mystical power of the pen. I've always had a facility for carving, but to cut a pen, you need a knife of a certain shape with a certain curvature in the blade. If it isn't that curvature, you're never gonna cut a good tip. In the seventh century, calligraphers wrote the Quran on treated animal skins called parchment. The parchment was so important and so expensive that sometimes they even reused it and they scraped away an earlier text and rewrote on top of it. And what's happened over time is the earlier text has darkened and you can actually see it underneath. Most of them, you know, they're readable, they're legible, they're practical, they're very, very interesting, but they don't rise to the level of art. But every now and then you see one of them and, and you look at it and say, how on earth could this guy have done that, you know? How'd they do their ink? How'd they cut their pen? We don't even know what the angle the pens were cut, but it simply takes your breath away. Islamic calligraphy was forever altered by a new invention from the East, paper. Paper was introduced into the Islamic world in the 8th century due to interaction between China and the Islamic Caliphate. So the technique of paper making and actual paper makers were transported from China to Islamic lands. And paper just takes off in an Islamic context. Just as important as the pen, the paper must be specially treated and prepared for calligraphy. The man who taught me paper making or paper prep took me aside one day and said, I'm going to show it all to you. The paper is rubbed with a rag that has a bit of soap on it. The soap is dry rubbed on the rag and it's, it's, a, it's a wool felt and, and it's rubbed all over the paper to give it lubrication. Otherwise, the burnisher would snag the, the surface and just scratch the heck out of it. You want to have it smooth so the pen will glide across the surface, but you also don't want it slippery. You want to have the paper have a grab to it, just enough. So the, it, it holds the pen, doesn't slip. The ink sits on the surface, doesn't penetrate. For the calligrapher, the process of copying the words of the Quran is, in itself, a meditation, a prayer, as God speaks through the pen. And when you write, it just writes itself. You know, your own connection with it feels minimal because your, your concentration is concentration without thinking about it being concentration. Uh, it's what the uh, old Arabs used to call the sahl uh, al-mumtani, which is the, um, the ease that comes from practice that makes the hard thing look, look easy. Now it is impossible if you are writing with a reed pen to write more than two or three letters with one pen stroke. You have to recharge your pen. You have to dip it back into the ink. 
But the point with calligraphy is to not see those strokes, to not see the difference between one and the next, to imagine that it was written with an unending pen. The old guys used to hold their breath under the theory that if you hold your breath when the pen is in motion, the breath goes down into your hand, through the pen and into the paper. And that's what would give it that life. And, uh, or breath as they would call it. You are not looking to see any human interaction. You are looking to see the divine. And when you see a manuscript that has all these little marks on it, that's a later manuscript because it's meant to be used by someone who's actually reading the text, not just using it to recall what he already had memorized. We also have chapter headings that are illuminated. Illumination is a very important art form in the production of Islamic manuscripts. It serves to navigate the reader through the different sections of the text. Because calligraphy basically is for reading, you know? It's not really about paper, pens, ink, and stuff like that. It's about meaning. And in my case, you know, I'm an American. I obviously, uh, wherever I go, you know, I'm the pink one, you know. Uh, and uh, I, you see a photograph of all the calligraphers, you know, and I'm in there, you know, and uh, that guy looks really funny, you know. But it's, uh, what am I doing with it? So I try to, I try to bring it out, what it means. And, that, and for me, that's, that's absolutely the number one thing. I, I, I have access to this material, and I have to pass it on. It is that divine presence embodied in the word that appears throughout Islamic art as writing becomes ornament. I'm always moved when I hold a plate or a ceramic object or, or a metal pen case and think to myself, I'm holding the same thing that someone a thousand years ago or 600 years ago held. I'm repeating the experience. I'm in a different place a different moment in history, I'm a different human being. Everything about my world is different except that object, and that object comes forward intact. That's very moving. Many buildings in the Islamic world are imbued with the voice of God as elaborate inscriptions speak from their stone walls. They really are beautiful to look at. Even if one doesn't understand them, one can always appreciate their beauty. And those inscriptions are usually in places that you cannot really read. You're not expected to read, but you expect to relate to them because you know what's going to be there. You just know what sorts of verses of the Quran are used, for example, in certain buildings, or uh, in the case of Alhambra, it's the beautiful poetry. The Alhambra, was built in the 14th century by the last Muslim rulers of Granada, Spain. Part fortress, part palace, the Alhambra provided a princely refuge from the ravages of a fading empire. In order to feel the Alhambra, to know what was meant, you have to go slowly and read the poetry that is written just at eye level inside the building. I could spend hours standing by a window, reading inscription, looking at this. That's what it was made for. It is meant to be lived in. In some cases, some of the writing actually is as if the building is speaking about itself. So you have the dome or the wall or the fountain talking to the viewer and telling you what it's about and how it functions or um, how it's set within the uh, building itself. The water basin whispers, Melted silver flows through the pearls which it resembles in its pure dawn beauty. Water and marble seem to be as one. The calligraphy, as it melds into ornament, the boundary between the two is so subtle that they become so extraordinarily good at just weaving shapes in and out of one another. Are these zoomorphic? Are they, are they, did they come out of vegetable life? You know, you can't really tell, and it doesn't make any difference because they arrive at a place that totally masks and has left the place from which they came.
Jeff works for peace in the media by creating a better understanding of Muslims and Islam. By telling stories through this modern medium of film, we're really able to touch the hearts and minds of millions. There are many great stories about Muslims. We look for the ones that appeal to the broadest audience possible. Let's make peace happen.